So we're going to move on to talk about some of the issues you often encounter with the Green's function and how you have to modify it in order to accommodate essentially what's going to be problems with your null space. If you have operators that have a null space, you're going to have to start thinking about using what's called the modified Green's function formulation because uh, what we know is that when we think about uh, a linear operator sa uh, or a right-hand side satisfying a solvability condition, that issue will still play a role also in solving uh, these LU equals F problems using the Green's function. So I want to talk about that and how we could still use the Green's function technique um, but accommodate the fact that we can have non-trivial null spaces for operators. So what about that null space? So remember, we're trying to solve L equals F. And essentially what we found is the Green's function is this fundamental solution. And once we find that fundamental solution, all we have to do for any given F is integrate it against that Green's function and you have your solution. Okay? And so the operator comes in this form, L equals F, with some associated boundary conditions. And um, what we haven't talked about is the fact that what if that operator actually has some kind of non-trivial null space? And what are the consequences of this? There's always a consequence if you have a non-trivial null space. And so it's something you have to think really carefully about. Because a non-trivial null space is like having a zero eigenfunction. And these correspond to invariances of this operator that if you don't account for them, you will not properly get a solution to your governing equations L equal to F. So we want to think about this. And let's start off with just thinking about self-adjoint operators for the moment. So normally you would think about the null space of the adjoint problem. But if it's self-adjoint, it's just looking at the operator itself and its null space LV equals to 0. And what we're going to assume here is that V is non-trivial. That I can actually find a scenario in which I find a solution, non-trivial solution, to LV equals to 0. So that is the null space. And the problem with that, or not the problem with that, is that if I try to write down a solution now to L equals F, then my solution is some solution I found U0, but I can always add some constant times the null space, and that's still a solution. In other words, I have an infinite number of solutions due to the existence of having a non-trivial null space. And of course, I have to figure out, how do I pin this down, right? I've just added some null space function onto this, and that's still a solution. And so it's, it's not unique. So we have to figure out how to address this issue. We've talked about it in terms of eigenfunction expansions, and now we have to address it directly in terms of Green's functions and their construction. So we go back to our solvability conditions. What we require when we solve L equals F is that F should be orthogonal to the null space of the adjoint operators. So that's, this is the Fredholm alternative stated simply as an inner product, right? So F is your forcing. V is the null space function of the adjoint operator. And you need this to be orthogonal. And of course, if you have no null space, if there is no non-trivial vector to the null space, then V is 0 and it's automatically satisfied and you don't have to worry about any kind of solvability issues. However, if you have a non-trivial null space, then it better be orthogonal to F. Or you get into this issue, and it's really representing the fact that you have an infinite number of solutions available to you, for instance, or no solutions. Those are the two options for you. F can be outside of the range of the operator at L, or you have this invariance, which gives you an infinite number of solutions. It's very much like AX equal to B. When the determinant is 0, there are two options. One is that, in fact, you have no solution, or it could be that you have an infinite number of solutions. And in either case, the same thing shows up here when you're talking about these linear operators. So let's construct the Green's function. Remember, I've assumed a self-adjoint operator. So the Green's function satisfies the following set of equations. So remember, LG now is the adjoint equation. And it's forced by the delta function, which is the normal way we think about constructing the Green's function, with the same boundary conditions as was satisfied by the original function u. And so what we want to think about is that's our Green's function uh, formulation. And we want to start thinking about what does it mean in terms of solvability. 
Now, if you remember, solvability required that the right-hand side function f be orthogonal to the null space. In the case of the Green's function, the right-hand side function is the delta function. Okay, so that is our forcing. So if I have a non-trivial null space, I ask the question, is it orthogonal to this delta function, which is the forcing for the Green's function? But if we know when we do this calculation here, if you hit the delta function against any function, it has the sifting property. So what it does is it actually pulls out the value of the non-trivial null space function at C, which let's say generically is not going to be 0. So if you have a non-trivial null space, in fact, you do not satisfy the Fredholm alternative theorem. And this is just calculation that shows you this. We needed this to be 0, and it's not. However, we can make modifications to the problem in order to address this issue. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to reformulate the Green's function problem into, into what's called the modified Green's function problem. So another way to think about when I say modified Green's function, what you should be thinking underneath is there is a non-trivial null space that's there. And that's why you have to reframe it in terms of this modified uh, Green's function formulation. So the way that this is for reformulated now is LG, just like before, is equal to the delta function minus what I add here now. It's not just the right-hand side has a delta function. It now has this product of V of x times V of c. And v, remember, is the, null sp is the function that's spanning this null space. By the way, I, I could have multiple functions spanning the null space. But right now, let's just assume there's just v that spans this. So this is now my new right-hand side function. And I'm going to call that f. So the Green's function doesn't just satisfy right-hand side as a delta function. It's right-hand side as a delta function minus a product of the null space functions. One with c, one with v, uh, x. Okay, plus boundary conditions, same as before. So now this is what I want to solve, and why does this sol satisfy solvability? Well, so now what I can do is I can take the right hand side f, which is the delta function plus the product of these two functions, and take its inner product with respect to the null space v. This should be zero, and let's check it out. See what we get. So now I put in the f, which is the delta function minus v of x, v of c inner product with v of x. The delta function pulls out v of c. And then if I integrate this, I can pull out the v of c. And then I get the inner product of v with itself. And I'm assuming an orthonormal function, eigen, uh, normal space, uh, uh, sorry, null space uh, function. And this becomes just 0. So in formulating it this way, where if I, if I normalize the null space function v to unity, then in fact, when I apply the solvability or Fredholm alternative theorem, I, in fact, now have it satisfied by making this accommodation or adjustment. So what I've done is artificially come into the problem, and I have made the Green's function satisfy the Fredholm alternative by adding to the right-hand side. So I don't just have a delta function in there. I've picked the right functions to be in there so that I can satisfy the Fredholm alternative. OK, so here it is. Here's now the formulation of the modified Green's function problem. I'm solving yell equals f. And the modified Green's function satisfies. Now I'm just going to a gen generic operator that doesn't have to be self-adjoint. I look at the adjoint solution, adjoint problem. The adjoint problem is g of m. I'm calling this now a subscript m for the modified Green's function is equal to the delta function minus this product of null space functions. So this is the modification you make when you have a null space in your operator. <coughs> OK, so let's work this out then and try to find what is my solution then. Now that I have this reformulated Green's function, if you remember from normal Green's function theorem, what I do is I just basically take the original problem, uh, take the inner product with the Green's function, and I can pop out the solution. Let's look at what happens now with this modified Green's function. So I look at L equal to f. Here it is. And I'm going to take this equation here, and I'm going to take its inner product, 
with respect to this modified Green's function. So all, the, all I did here, on the left and the right sides, LU, inner product with modified Green's function, F, inner product with modified Green's function. And of course, what we always do, we take this operator L, we move it over to the other side to act on the modified Green's function. There it is. That's the definition of the adjoint. And this is equal to a delta function, plus this, these extra terms now. So now what you're going to get is this is going to be equal to the delta function acting on u minus this product of this null space. So first of all, I use the sifting property on the first term to pull out u of c. And now the second term is minus v of c inner product u and v is equal to fg. So now I'm taking the inner product here of the, of the solution itself uh, with the null space function. Okay? So this is, uh, this is uh, how, uh, sorry, this is, so this is sort of the, 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 now the calculation. Now look over here. By the way, that should have been a g of m here. This is here. This is still my normal term I had originally in the Green's function. And uh, so that is still there in my solution. And then my solution then looks something like this. So I still have this V of X floating around with some weighting. So all this is is some kind of weight, right? This is just some number. And I don't even care what it is. It's some arbitrary constant, potentially. And what I know is because I have this null space, I can add any amount of null space and it's still a solution. So all this is representing is some constant sitting in front of my null space vector. And then here, this is the inner product of f against the modified Green's function. So overall then, my solution looks like the following. u of x is equal to, I take my right hand side, integrate it against my Green's, modified Green's function, and then I add some arbitrary amount of the null space function. So I've in this formulation, I've satisfied the solvability conditions. I have this arbitrary constant C that's there, which is actually just to be expected. Because in fact, if I have that null space, I know I can add any amount of it to the solution, and it's still a solution. And so this is now represented here in this solution form. So that's the generic theory. What I'd like to do is give you an example of computing this modified Green's function. So what I'm going to do is take this equation here. Here it is. Uxx is equal to f of x with no flux boundary conditions on the ends. And I'm going to first approach this problem with the standard way you would solve for the Green's function. I'm not going to even, I'm going to uh, pretend I don't know about the modified Green's function and ask, well, what if I just try to compute the Green's function for this in the standard way? So the adjoint problem. It looks like this. It's actually self-adjoint. There it is. So it's vfx uh, is equal to 0. Here are your boundary conditions. And remember, the Green's function is going to put a delta function over there. But here's the thing to notice. There is a null space to this because the 0 eigenvector here is actually a constant. So this constant is the null space. And notice, you can see this right away, because your no flux boundary conditions here allow you to put in a con an arbitrary constant that satisfies all of this. And, um, and it's because, the, because you've taken the derivatives, taken the derivatives of the constant, the constant disappears here, the constant disappears here. So you have the zero eigenvalue, which has the eigenfunction, which is the constant. So this is your null space that you have to this problem, okay? And it's a non-trivial solution now, right? It's an arbitrary constant, okay? Oftentimes, you'll get some more interesting structure. This will be actually some kind of spatial structure. But here, it's a very simple null space, which is just a constant. So the question is, what is this constant going to do when we start thinking about solving this with the standard Green's function method? And then how do we fix it up? So let's go with the standard Green's function method. I just ignore the fact that there's a null space, uh, non-trivial null space. So I take my Green's function, which is gxx. Now I put in a delta function on the right-hand side, satisfying these boundary conditions. Okay? And I'm going to show you right away that if I take my right-hand side and 
I go ahead and compute the Fredholm alternative. I take f, which is the delta function, and v, which is the null space, which is a constant. So we can just say it's 1. Here it is. Then this solve this Fredholm alternative, which the f is supposed to be orthogonal to v, that's not true. It's actually, in fact, equal to 1. So I'm violating the Fredholm alternative by not making adjustments to this Green's function. However, you say, well, fine, I can still go compute solutions. In fact, let's do it. So this is a pretty easy one. So if I look at here, what I'm going to do is compute solutions to the left of x is equal to c and to the right of x equals to c, which is just g of xx equals to 0. So your solutions are ax plus b. But they have to satisfy these boundary conditions here. So in the end, your solution to the left and right are just two different constants, a and b. But you remember, I still have to, I still have to satisfy the interface condition, which says that the Green's function has to be continuous. And then there's a jump in the first derivative. And the problem is, what you find is these solutions cannot satisfy the jump in the derivative conditions. In fact, what you find is you cannot solve that. You don't satisfy that 2 by 2 system of equations to try to pin down a and b because you can't satisfy both continuity and the jumps in the derivatives. And this is because we haven't explicitly accounted for the fact that there is a null space. So we're going to make the modification here. So in other words, your standard Green's function method breaks down and it gives you a nonsensical solution because it's not accounting for this, the fact that you have an, a null space there. So what we're going to do is modify this. And here's what we're going to modify it to. Remember that my null space is just a constant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my Green's function. It's going to satisfy what looked like it had before, the delta function, minus the null space, which is a constant. And specifically, I'm going to take this null space to be 1 over L. So this is going to be my new forcing function. So I've made a modification. I've added the null space. I'm still satisfying the same boundary conditions. I've just made that one accommodation. And then I can ask the questions. First of all, is solvability satisfied? OK, so if I go back to Fred on alternative, I have my right-hand side function f against the null space. So f itself is this delta function minus 1 over l. My null space is a constant, which is normalized to just to be 1. So I take this integral, and I integrate this up. And what you end up getting is 1 minus l. 1 over L. And that's why you, you, I picked the 1 over L as a constant, because now this becomes 1, and this becomes 1 minus 1 is 0. So in other words, I picked that null space and an arbitrary constant in front of it such that solvability is satisfied. So now I have no issue with the Fredholm alternative. I now have um, a self-consistent formulation for that Green's function problem. So now things get more interesting. Now when I solve this problem, because on the other side there lives a constant, my solutions aren't just ax plus b. My solutions now, because it's non-homogeneous, actually take this form right here, ax plus b. The ax plus b satisfies the homogeneous equation. And this x squared over 2l satisfies is the particular solution that satisfies the inhomogeneous equation. So now my solutions aren't uh, going to collapse and, allow, and not allow me to satisfy, in fact, the boundary conditions and the, the continuity and the jump and derivative conditions. And now, because now I have a richer set of solutions because of that right-hand side forcing. So in fact, if you do this and use that solution and you match the continuity and the derivatives at, at uh, and you get the derivative jump right, here's what your modified Green's function solution looks like. You do a little algebra. You get some arbitrary constant c, x squared over 2l, c plus c, minus x, x squared over 2l. And one of the things that's very common for people to do is to write down the solution in a symmetric form so that x, if you interchange x and c, they look the same. It just makes you go from this side to this side or this side to this side. So in other words, if I change x to c here, I, it looks like this solution. c to x here, it looks like this solution. So right now it's not in that form, but I can pick a constant c, which is arbitrary, to make it that form. So I pick the constant c 
so that I actually have a symmetrized form of the modified Green's function, which is given right by here. So you see this modification makes all the difference for you to be able to produce some reasonable solution. And it's all related back to this Fredholm alternative theorem and solvability and the existence of a non-trivial null space. So the minute you have a non-trivial null space is when you have to really pay attention to your problem because a lot of the very interesting things that go on in your problem are associated with having zero eigenvalues and zero eigenfunctions and are associated eigenfunctions. And you just, you see it show up here and make you explicitly have to deal with it and figure out how to get rid of that problem. Now the, the full solution, by the way, once you have this modified Green's function, is just this. <coughs> Your solution, u of x, is you hit the, f, the forcing function f against the Green's function, and then you add the null space. And in this case, the null space was a constant. So you just put it back in there, and that is, in fact, your modified Green's function solution. So you can still use this concept of having a fundamental solution to your problem, but you have to modify it. In fact, most of the techniques we will continue to develop throughout this course, especially around perturbation theory, is going to really revolve around this concept of solvability and making sure that solvability is satisfied is going to give us a lot of the interesting structure we need to understand the kind of problems we're solving.